High over Malaya, pilots of Sabre jet fighters of the Royal Australian Air Force continue their training. They operate there as part of the air component of the Commonwealth Strategic Reserve. These young pilots are among nearly a thousand Australian airmen who make up the strength of the RAAF base at Butterworth in northern Malaya. But before these Sabre fighters could be operated in Malaya, they had to be flown from their Australian base over 6,000 miles away. This then is the story of Operation Sabre Ferry. It is the story of how the RAAF successfully carried out its greatest ferry flight since the end of the war. Before the Sabres left Australia, the squadrons were inspected by FM Osborne. Within the service itself, the plans and preparations for the flight were watched with keen interest by all concerned. Two famous units of the RAAF, number 3 squadron and number 77 squadron, were to make the long ferry flight from their bases on the east coast of Australia. The staging points were at Townsville, Darwin, Netherlands, New Guinea, the Philippines and Borneo. While such a long and exacting flight was nothing unusual for the few senior officers taking part, for the younger pilots it was a thrilling experience as it was their first flight outside their homeland. The whole operation was planned as a routine training exercise, however, and without undue ceremony, the takeoffs got underway. Number 77 Squadron took off from Richmond while number three squadron had earlier taken off from Williamtown. Four aircraft operated together, each group of four following close upon the other. Both squadrons made an overnight stop at Townsville, and the last contact with the homeland was at Darwin, where some old Australians showed a happy interest in the air activities of these young Australians. At Darwin, the RAAF is going ahead with the building of a new strip, which will make it one of the largest in Australia and capable of accommodating aircraft from anywhere in the world. So, for the RAAF members working at Darwin, it was nothing unusual to find themselves hosts to a long succession of fighter aircraft and their pilots. The ground servicing parties quickly had the Sabres marshalled and inspected in readiness for the next flight. After a brief rest, the Sabre pilots took off again on the long hop to Netherlands, New Guinea. From Biak, a thousand miles from Darwin, they flew to the Philippines, where they used the old Giwan strip. Here, all the ground facilities, fuel and personnel, had to be air freighted in advance. As in all places, the locals in the Philippines showed their interest in Operation Sabre Ferry. In addition to those who had jobs to do, whether in handling the aircraft or in carrying for the crews, there was always the wide-eyed small boy who looked and wondered at the visitors and their equipment. The American and Netherlands governments, as well as many Australian departments, such as civil aviation, were quick to provide assistance whenever a request was made. 
They aided the RAAF ground parties by the provision at some locations of oxygen supplies and firefighting facilities and with assistance in refuelling where necessary. The local servicemen were always interested observers. Operation Sabre Ferry was the most important air movement of the RAAF outside Australia since the end of the Second World War. Flight planning in such an operation was of extreme importance. To aid pilots taking part, Neptune and Canberra aircraft carried out weather reconnaissance flights and provided aerial radio beacons. Dakota and Hercules transport aircraft flew special RAAF ground parties to all landing areas, where they were on hand throughout the exercise to assist in the operation of control tower duties. In addition to the RAAF aircraft providing search and rescue cover, which fortunately was not needed, aircraft such as these of the United States Air Force also assisted in sea patrols. And so Operation Sabre Ferry continued. From the Philippines, the Sabres flew a further thousand miles to Borneo, until against the outline of the radar of the RAAF already operating at Butterworth, the Sabres, four at a time, came winging in to make their Malayan touchdown. Operation Sabre Ferry had been a big job, with many sections of the RAAF playing a part. It was a big job, but it proved a job well done. Fire is a hazard always feared on aerodromes, but these new fire trucks of the RAAF can hurtle across any sort of country. They can be accelerated to 50 miles an hour within 17 seconds. This practice fire proved a workout for the new trucks and the crews who man them. Teamwork is essential, and every man must know his task. The tanks on the new truck can provide water or foam at a fantastic rate, and this monitor turret can throw over 4,000 gallons of fire-smothering foam a minute. And here's the reason why oil and petrol fires are controlled so quickly. This foam, which uses as its base the humble blood and bone protein from the abattoirs, first smothers fire and refuses to be melted away. But even the big truck is dwarfed by the Air Force's new Hercules transport aircraft as it's driven aboard to be delivered to a forward base. Deadly addition to the armory of the RAAF is the Sidewinder air-to-air -air missile, built in the United States and named after a desert rattlesnake. Addition of the Sidewinder to the Australian Sabre jet fighter has increased its effectiveness tremendously. Two Sidewinders are carried by the Sabre, one under each wing. While details of the Sidewinder's performance are still on the secret list, it can be said that it's powered by a solid propellant and homes on the heat emitted from the target aircraft. At Woomera rocket range, a test firing by the RAAF of a Sidewinder against the Australian-built Jindavik illustrates the deadly accuracy of the weapon. Here we see the airborne Sabre and the Jindavik. 
As it's released from the attacking aircraft, the Sidewinder homes onto its target at supersonic speed and with deadly accuracy. The Jindavik just didn't have a chance. 